Greetings, welcome back. Today we're talking about section 7.2, partial derivatives. We are going to continue talking about interpreting partial derivatives and we're going to compute second order partial derivatives. So let me see if we can find where we left off. So second order partial derivatives are going to look like a mess, so I apologize, so I'll put this up there. Uh, like most definitions, it's kind of rough until we actually start trying these out. Um, but if you recall, in the one-dimensional case, we took second derivatives primarily to talk about concavity or curvature of some function. And that's actually still true in these functions of more than one variable, although it, it is a little more subtle. We're going to take a bunch of time in 7.3 talking about that subtlety, so we don't have to worry about that too much. Right now, we're going to focus on just the computational strategies. How can we figure out what these partial derivatives look like and, and what complexities are introduced by having a second input variable? So in the one-dimensional case, there was no ambiguity about who the input was. It's only f of x, so you would take the derivative with respect to x, and then with respect to x again. But in the case with more than one input variable, there's four different combinations, depending on the order and which variables you use. So f sub xx, which is probably the most common way you'll write it, because the alternative is this mess. This says take the derivative with respect to x, and then with respect to x again. This says take the derivative with respect to x, and then take that, find that expression you just came up with and find its derivative with respect to y. This is sometimes called a, actually both of these are often referred to as the mixed partials. And that's because you're sort of switching which variable gets to be the input from one computation to the next. Uh, and then we're back to the, the last combination where now it's all y's. So derivative of uh, f with respect to y and then with respect to y one more time we're going to end up with a nice situation for these mixed partials uh, and but we'll sort of explore that and, and see so an example i apologize <clears throat> this is a, the same function we started off with in the previous slide although this gives us more context um, so this says okay if i want to take the derivative of this expression with x as the input this says do that twice take the derivative with x and then do it again so between so this expression right here is what we would have what we would get if we take this guy and take its derivative with respect to x so we're going to get e to the stuff back again and then this little bit is from chain rule the derivative of that exponent so if you recall back in the previous video if you took a look at that one we ended up with a times 2x afterwards well that's exactly this expression again so here is f sub x basically well, we're not done though, because this says the second derivative, so we're gonna take the derivative of this with respect to x one more time. So we start with our final product and find its derivative. Well, because you have x's times stuff with other x's in it, we have to do product rule. Everybody's favorite. So here is the derivative of just the two x times the e piece left alone. And then the other combination, the first piece left alone, two x, and then times the derivative of the second piece. Well, since the, the e to the x squared plus 2y thing is exactly what we just ran into a minute ago, its derivative is going to look pretty familiar. It's going to be e to the stuff back again times some chain rule. So there's our expression. And then all of this came from product rule. And now I'm going to be writing over my own printed stuff in the slides, whoops, oh well. So uh, there's, our, there's our second partial with just x's. Here's the second partial with just y's. So now again, we're gonna see something familiar. This expression on the inside here is exactly the derivative that we came up with in uh, our example from, first example from the previous video. This is f sub y. The derivative of this with respect to y, since y is up in that exponent, this expression is more complicated than just y. So we get e to the stuff times the derivative of that exponent. Since x doesn't get changed, its derivative is 0. Derivative of 2y is just 2. 
So there's that extra factor for excitement. But because we're doing the second partials, we're not done. So this says, uh, take the derivative of all this stuff inside here. <laughs> Fortunately, in this case, there's no extra y that got put out in front, unlike this x case. So we don't have to do product rule here because there's no variable times other variable situation happening. No y's times other y's. So the constant two just hangs out in front, take the derivative of e to the stuff, and basically we get the exact same thing back again. So we've got all this expression here is uh, chain rule. So there's our second partial with just y's. So f sub y y would be another way to write this one. Now we've got the mixed partials, which if as if it were seemed possible at all, has even more confusing notation. But this says do the y stuff first. So I will try to underline here. We can make pretty good use of the work that we've already done. This says do y first. Well, we've already done that. We already know that f sub y looks like 2e to this stuff. But now here's the twist. Now we take this expression and take its derivative with respect to x. Okay, so now we switch our, our mindset and say, okay, now x is the, the variable in this expression. So this involves some chain rule. We have the two hanging out in front. Derivative e to the stuff is e to the stuff. And we have instance number 12 trillion of chain rule. Well, probably not really 12 trillion. Feels like it sometimes though. So there's our chain rule. And that came from the derivative of this top piece with x as the input. That's the most confusing facet here. So there's no more derivative instructions, so this must be, another way to write this would be f sub y x. y first and then x after. And then the last one, the other mixed partial, starts with x's and then finds the derivative with respect to y. So there's f sub x. Again, we can kind of steal this because we had this expression uh, already part of our work from before. And then we want this expression uh, of this, thankfully, with respect to y, actually, that's nicer, because uh, with respect to x, that was the one we had to do all this fun product rule stuff. Uh, and in, instead, in this case, all we have to do is note that y appears in the exponent. So we have 2x, which for the purpose of this computation is just a constant. So 2 times x is just sitting out in front, e to the stuff, and one more instance of, you guessed it, chain rule. So I'm going to spoil this in a second for you, but you might notice something about these mixed partials. You'd, if we actually simplified a little bit, we'd have 4x times e to the stuff in this one. This would look like 4x times e to the stuff in that one. It turns out that's not a coincidence. The la these mixed partials actually are always equal for the types of functions that we're actually interested in. There's, some, there's an asterisk on that for mathematicians. but we are going to uh, ignore that for the most part because the types of functions for which this doesn't work, uh, <clears throat> it turns out, are really not that important to us. They don't come up in applications primarily. Okay, so there's the, the uh, mixed partials and the uh, other second partials, the ones with just x's and y's. We actually have a chain rule for partial derivatives when those inputs themselves depend on other variables. So again, we're gonna, I'm gonna give you a, a definition, well, theorem, and uh, it's gonna take a moment and probably a few examples before this really sinks in. So the chain rule for partial derivatives says, if you wanna know some rate of change in some function, again, we're picturing that z is some function f of x, y, but actually even more confusingly, we're, we're really thinking of these inputs themselves as being functions of something else like time. So the, the easy analogy, well not easy, but maybe the most accessible analogy to compare to with recent examples, if you recall to the previous video, the one with the production function, we had labor and capital that contributed to production. You could imagine that labor and capital might change over time so that <clears throat> those quantities themselves might be functions of t. If that's the case and we want to know how production changes as time goes on, then we would need to, this product basically. So the way that I'm supposed to read this uh, essentially 
is that there's one term that is stuff that's uh, change in Z from X stuff. So there's kind of its own little chain rule stuck in there. DZ, DX, or partial Z, partial X. How is Z changing as X changes? And then how is X changing over time? That product would tell me how much change in Z or the rate of change in Z is contributed from the X variable. The same thing, uh, but for the other variable is true in this case. This is the change in Z from Y stuff. So this other variable also has the opportunity to have some impact on Z if we're seeing how this, this function changes with respect to time. So this whole chunk has the exact mirror alignment as this stuff with X's. How does Z change as Y changes? How does Y change over time? So this is just a, literally multiplication between these two things. Okay, so let's try out an example. So <laughs> this is and maybe uh, um, incorrect to refer to this as a quick example, but nevertheless, that's, that's the title it's getting. So here's our Z function, very exciting. And then notice that X and Y also independently uh, uh, have some sort of reliance on T. So this, there's a, a, another variable here. <clears throat> so the rate of change in Z with respect to time, here's our chain rule formula. So we basically have four components that we need to figure out. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we've got partial Z, partial X. So that's going to go back to our relationship between Z's and X's. I need something that has both X and Z in it. Well, this is arguably, not arguably, this is the most complicated expression that we'll have to deal with. Because if you notice, X appears both in the numerator and in the denominator. Which means that we're going to have to deal with uh, something that looks like a, a ratio of variables. That's always a challenge for us. In particular, our main strategy when dealing with ratios of variables is quotient rule. So that's exactly what it is that's going on here. So now we're looking at this big expression uh, down below. This guy right here all comes from quotient rule. <laughs> so we have, here's our low, x plus 2, d high, so the denominator times the derivative of the top. And remember, since we're doing this with respect to x, the y portion is going to be 0. Derivative of that is just 2x. And then we take away the numerator. This is our high, d low. Derivative of the bottom, derivative of x plus 2, is just 1. That's all over the denominator squared. So that's where all of that excitement comes from. Um, I'm going to try to write this off to the side so that it doesn't impinge upon the, the uh, next writing here. Uh, so that's it for partial z, partial x. I mean, I say that's it, and I realize that there's a lot that happened there. But. So then we're moving on down the line, dx dt. So again, I'm looking for a, uh, an equation, some sort of relationship that connects x's and t's together. Well, there it is. So dx dt would just be the derivative of this right side with t as the input. That's pretty straightforward. So that's manageable. So now we're going to move on to partial z, partial y. The thing that relates z's and y's is back to this expression. y only appears in one spot, though. And that's actually kind of nice, because that means that this expression could be rewritten. Uh, y only appears in that spot. Let's see, we can break stuff up over uh, things in the numerator. That is one nice way that fractions work. I don't get to change the denominator pieces, but I could write this as 2 different fractions added together. And you might notice this fraction has no y's in it. So as far as this partial with respect to y is concerned, this is all zero. And then even maybe even more than that, we could take that second fraction and write it as just y times. In other words, instead of having it in this numerator spot, have it written to the side of the fraction. So the derivative, as complicated as this all looks, the derivative with respect to y, 0 plus, well, 1 times 1 over x plus 2. So all of that contributes to this rate of change. Really, the constant that's next to y is the only thing that survives that partial derivative. Finally, we've got dy dt. And again, the only expression that relates y's and t's is this last guy. 
derivative of this uh, t squared with respect to t is just 2t. So we have some monstrous thing, but this is how this z function would be changing with the dependence on time. Tidying up just a little bit, we can get ourselves a, a, a big fraction here at the beginning, all times three, and then put the 2t on top of that. But this second to last line, at least for my class, would be perfectly fine as a final answer. Okay, we'll come back in the next video to talk about uh, incremental approximation.